Good morning, church. Go ahead and keep your Bibles out. We're going to be in Mark 12, but we're also going to be in several different places throughout the scriptures. So uh, if you don't have a Bible, we have some in the back. And if you lift your hand up, one of our ushers would love to bring those by to you um, this morning. So a little while ago, I was speaking with someone who uh, doesn't really go to church. They kind of grew up in the faith, but then drifted. And I talked to them about their first experience going back to church in years and I'm, I'm having this conversation with her, and she, she begins sharing with me all of the things that kind of led her to this decision. And so she chooses the church that she wants to attend, uh, first time in probably a decade at least. And she shows up to this church, she sits down, the music goes well, everything feels really nice, the people are, they, they greet her very well. And the pastor gets up and preaches, and that morning they are preaching on money. How do you think she received that, you know? Isn't that kind of the, the, the I guess, the, the caveat or the, the misnomer that, man, all these preachers do is talk about money. All they want you to do is give their money to you and to the church and da-da-da-da-da-da. And here she is sitting underneath this teaching. And no matter how biblical it was, she said, I just couldn't get past that the first time I'd go to church in 10 years, they're talking about money. And so I began to have this conversation with her about how important it is and how Jesus talked about it and how as much as it does probably feel like the church talks about money, I think you need to remind yourself how much Jesus talks about money. And so this morning, we're not necessarily talking about money, but we're not necessarily not talking about money. So last week, we preached this text, Mark chapter 12. And so if you're sitting here going, wow, is he just preaching the same sermon? The answer is yes and no. All right? Yes, I am preaching the same exact text. No, I am not preaching the same exact sermon. Last week, we looked at this idea of how to love God. So in this entire series, we're asking the question of, man, picture this. What would it look like to steward your relationship with God? Meaning, what would it look like for you to take care of and to be invested into your relationship with God? And last week, we looked at the number one principle in order to have this relationship, in order to steward it well, we have to do what? We have to love God. And if you know anything about Piedmont, our mission is to love God, love people, and invest in his kingdom. And that third part, invest in his kingdom, is tied to this text that we're in this morning. Mark, Mark chapter 12, just look at that last verse that Brother Landon just read for us. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all of your strength. What he's calling us to do in this text is to invest in his kingdom. And what we're going to be doing this morning is we're going to be going through a lot of the scriptures. And I want to paint this picture for you. I want to show you the thread of what it means to invest in his kingdom. In other words, I want to show you what it looks like to follow up the phrase, love God with action. That's what investing in his kingdom means. Because I think sometimes we understand this idea of love God. We sing the song that we just sang, all my love, all my love, you can have it all. All I own, all my heart, all my soul, you can have it all. And it's very easy with a good melody and a solid band to sing those words. How easy is it for us to live those words? You know what I mean? Like think about where you are. Think about your relationships. Think about your finances. How easy is it for us to steward that part of our relationship and say, God, you can have it all. So that's what we're going to be doing this morning. I want to unpack and remind you a little bit in case you weren't here last week and maybe teach you what's going on in this passage that Landon just read for us. So what, what's happening, Jesus calls back in Mark chapter 12, 28 through 30. He's having this conversation with some religious people. A scribe approaches, think of him like almost like an academic, academic theologian, somebody who studies the word, you know, writes it down, this kind of deal. He asks Jesus a very important question. Hey, what's the most important commandment? He's doing this to see if Jesus is who he says he is, at least from an intellectual place. How smart is this guy? Jesus immediately goes back to the Old Testament, which is what this scribe would have wanted. He kind of quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, 
in Exodus 20. And he reminds him that you do it all in loving God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And what he's reminding us is that true love calls for all of you. True love doesn't say, oh man, I love you, but I'm going to hold this area of my life back. What he's teaching us is that loving God calls you into the unknown, relying on the love that you have come to know in God. Loving God calls you into the unknown, relying on the love that you have come to know in God. Throughout Scripture, God writes the narrative of investing in His kingdom in a multitude of ways, showing us various ways and different perspectives on how we are to steward this relationship with Him by investing in His kingdom. Now, I want to make sure that we all are on the same page of what I mean and the narrative and how this works. So before I dive into some specific Scriptures, I want to, I guess illustrate the narrative of God and your life and all of creation. So God creates the entire world from nothing, right? He creates it good and he creates it whole. And then humanity comes in and we sin and we broke our relationship with God. And in essence, we then broke the world around us. So when you wake up with a crick in your neck like I did three days ago, that should just remind you of sin. God did not create me to get old and die, right? I did that to myself. Adam and Eve did that to us. We do it to ourselves through sin, brokenness. That's what came into this world. God didn't just leave us there. He then unveils a plan of restoration and redemption. Adam and Eve begin to have children. God calls Noah to save a few people from the rest of the wretched world, and then he kind of starts over in essence. And then he chooses a people. He chooses a people for his name and for his glory. And he then gives them a system to follow and to live a life of abundance. The people rebel, and they begin to distort the system. So he sends prophets to call them to repent They ignore those prophets many times. God then sends the Messiah, his son, the second person of the Trinity. This Messiah comes and follows this system previously mentioned and previously installed, and he does so perfectly. And he is then murdered by the people who called themselves the children of God, but worshiped the system more than the creator of the system. Again, distorting God's intention. Are you following along? That's when you could say yes. Appreciate that. So the Messiah is murdered. The story's not over. He comes back to life. He tells the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal, abundant life. He comes in, he says, whoever loves him and invests in his kingdom will receive redemption and restoration. And now what we're going to talk about in this idea of stewarding our relationship and investing in his kingdom is what it means to walk in that relationship. What it means to believe in God. This is the grand narrative of the gospel and the Bible, God's story of redemption for humanity. So let's look back specifically to these chosen people. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to be in the first couple of verses, Genesis chapter 12. So by this point in the book of Genesis, We've already learned just a little bit about this guy named Abram. We know that he comes from a family of pagans, meaning they're not God followers. They don't follow nor believe in this God named Yahweh or Elohim. And this is the picture of who Abram is. Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, now keep, keep in mind, this are, these are like the first words to this guy, right? 
I need you to like, as we're reading this, understand the context. Abram comes from a family who does not believe in God. His dad was a pagan. His family were pagans. And all of a sudden, God speaks to Abram. We don't know exactly how he speaks. We don't know exactly what it looked like and what that moment is. But we know now the Lord says to Abram. He says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram is called into the own unknown right here. Hey, go to the land that I will show you. He is led by this now supernatural revelation of the love of God. Well, how, how can that be the love of God? God just spoke to Abram. He came exactly where he was in exactly the right time, and he sees him for exactly who he is. And God says, go. I see you. Now follow me. So Abram, going back to our quote, he relies on the love of God and goes into the unknown. Abram has no history with this God. But yet... He follows. If you've prayed a prayer and repented and believed in God, it should lead you to follow him. It wasn't a one-time thing that got you your fire insurance. It wasn't this thing that you just did of an emotional moment. It leads us to follow God. Too often in the church, we allow each other to drift from what it means to follow God. Oh man, they're saved, they're good. They're just backsliding. They're just struggling. Too often we allow brothers and sisters in Christ to do this. You allow me to do this. You allow others to do this. I allow you to do this. We have to hold each other accountable. Well, I'm not supposed to judge my brother and sister. That's actually not true. It's not true. Like, you are supposed to hold your brother and sister accountable. So if you can't judge to see if the fruit is rotten, what are you to do? How, how, do you, how could you hold them accountable? I'm supposed to spur you on to greater works. How do I spur you on without coming in your life and speaking the word of God in your life? Hey, I see this area that you're struggling in. How can I help you? See, when we see judge, we go, man, you shouldn't do that. You're a terrible human being. That's not what God does. He comes in and he gives us a better way. And if I'm following God, you know what we'll see? We'll see the fruits of that following in my life. And so this moment from Abram is an example to us on what it looks like to follow. It means that if you look back over your life and, and, and you look to see the footprints of the Lord... If they're there, then maybe you've been following the Lord. If they're not, then maybe you have some questions about what have I been doing? Have I just been going through this system or have I been worshiping the creator of the system? You know what I'm saying? There's a big difference between just being in the system of God and following the one who's created the system. So Abram follows and we should too. Now, I want to continue following his story. Flip over to chapter 17. Chapter 17. Abram has followed God, but along the way, Abram's had some mountaintop moments and some really valley lows. Genesis chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram. 
but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God uh, to be God to you and your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of, sojourn, of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Abram, right here, receives a new name, a new purpose, a new calling. This covenant defines him. This new name represents this new covenant that eventually points to Jesus, who brings us redemption and restoration. This is what God does for you and for me when we follow him. He makes us something new. He takes this old thing that was full of aspiration and maybe yearnings to follow God, and he gives us a new heart and says, now from that place you have my spirit, you have my heart, now live out my purposes. But I don't want us to miss the the key moment here. It's in verse 9, and this is where we're going to see the unfolding step of following God, investing. Verse 9, God says to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. See, we don't just receive this covenantal promise from God. We don't just receive blessings and grace. We receive it, and then we function from it. We've recognized through His supernatural revelation in our life who He is, And then we follow him because of that, because of that covenant. So for us in the New Testament, we've been made new in Christ when we have repented and believed. And he's made us new by the power of his spirit. And he says, follow me. What we may hear is follow me and we do it on our own strength. But what he's saying is follow me by the new spirit that I've given you. Okay, so we're laying some groundwork. If we accept the calling to follow God, but then don't walk with him, then we are not followers of God. The covenant isn't being kept. Now, look, I think there's some in the room that maybe uh, have been taught some bad theology. There is a good theological principle that is this idea of once saved, always saved. Meaning, if you have repented and believed in Christ, you are forever seated in his presence. At the right hand of him, essentially, he, he is saying, you are my son, you are my daughter. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. That is a true statement. What we sometimes believe in practicality about that theology is if we went to a camp or we were at VBS or we were in our parents' car or whatever the moment is, we walked down an aisle, had a very emotional decision, we prayed a prayer, maybe we even went to church for a little while, maybe we gave and tithed and served and did all the things, but we really didn't actually follow God. We just went through the motions of the system. You are not saved. Just because you prayed a prayer doesn't mean you're saved. We, we see this throughout Scripture time and time again, that following God is proven over our life. You can look back and see the footprints of God in your life, or you cannot. Well, how, how, how does this work? Go to Luke 8. I don't have time to preach a whole sermon on it. There's a parable in there, a parable of the soils, right? There, there's four different types of soils. There's only one of them that receives the, the gospel with joy and then walks it out. There's three others that receive it and fall or don't receive it at all or they grow up with the weeds and then they get choked out. 
Well, how do I know if I'm saved? Your life will prove it. Your heart. How, do, how does your spouse or your family member know that you love them? You live it out, right? Not out of obligation, but because you get to. You know what I'm saying? If you're wondering, how do I know if I'm saved? I, I, I would ask you, how do you know if you like a show on Netflix? You watch it. You turn it on. You're looking forward to it. You know? Oh, I'm a Christian, man. When's the last time you went to church? Oh, it's been a while. Okay? Strike one, maybe, right? For you. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you, you should look at your own heart. When's the last time you served in the church? Well, you know, since I don't really go to church, I don't really serve. But, you know, every day I find a way to serve. Do you? Okay, cool. That's great. How do you do that? Well, if there's an opportunity to share about Jesus, I do. Okay, great. So you share about Jesus. And then what do you do after they get saved? Do you tell them to go to church? Oh, no, I don't really go to church either. Okay, so when he tells you that you as a Christian should be with the followers, and then you don't follow, and you leave somebody else supposedly to Christ, but then you don't teach them to follow, now both of you aren't actually following. Now listen, I'm not telling you that you have to go to church to be saved. I'm not telling you that. The thief on the cross never went to church. I believe he's in heaven right now. Okay? But if God says, hey, gather with my people, Hey, help the widow and the orphan. Hey, keep all these commandments. Keep these statutes. Follow me in these ways, and then you don't do it. Do you love him? Or did you just go in the system? Oh, I'm just making sure I got my fire insurance. I'm just going through the motions. And if it was just this one moment in Abram, Abraham's story of how he says, hey, keep the covenant, then I think we could maybe, maybe gloss over it. But if you read through all 66 books, God tells you and I what it means to love him. And he begins to unpack it. Now, I, I don't have time to go through all this, but I'm just going to throw up some verses very quickly. Jeremiah 29, 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Why? And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. Now in context, what he is saying to Jeremiah is essentially this. Prosper the city, propel the gospel. Because what he's saying about Jeremiah's welfare and the people of God's welfare isn't just the physical needs in their life. He's saying you've been given a mission. If you're a follower and you love God, you've been given a mission. That mission is to make him known. And so what I want you to do is I want you to pray for your city. I want you to help see your city prosper. Because when your city prospers and the people see your heart for them, even in their brokenness, they will begin to understand and question, or misunderstand and question, why are you like this? And right in that moment of brokenness, you have an opportunity to weave the story of the gospel of redemption and restoration. This is what it means to live the gospel in our daily lives. Anytime we see brokenness, we can go back to, hey, but there's a better way. Anytime something's broken, yeah, I know. But redemption and restoration is right around the corner. Oh, I got a crick in my neck, the fall, but God didn't make me like this. God has a better plan for me. Brokenness should always lead us to this understanding of redemption and restoration in the cross. Haggai chapter 1, verse 8. Go up to the hills. And bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Here's that money. Here it is. All right? I'm a believer, 20-something years. I've been going to church, been doing this, been serving. I'm not going to give my money because, you know, they're corrupt. They don't use it well. This, that, and the other. Wrestle with this passage. What does he tell you to do? You love me, build my church. Oh, we build it with people because the church isn't, isn't just a building, it's people. You're right. When you get 100 people, where are you going to gather? Chris, we're coming to your house next week. Can we gather 100 and something people at your house? No, no. right? It's probably not going to happen. Some of y'all might have a house big enough. Oh, we don't need a house. We'll just meet outside. Okay. It's 97 degrees. Y'all want to go out there right now? No. You want some chairs while we do it? No. Mm-hmm. So, we then build buildings so the church people can be the church. 
And he says, build my place. That takes money and sacrifice. Oh, that's just one verse. Okay, Malachi 3. Will man rob God? Listen to that language. Will man rob God? Is that how you think about your money? Yet you were robbing me. But you say, uh, how, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse. You are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. He says, if you love me, your money is just a resource that you're giving back to me. And when you don't, you rob me. Go to Acts. There's this couple that just sold a lot of land. And they're going to the apostles. And they're real proud. Man, look how much money we're about to give. And they held back some. And Peter looks at them. And in the power of God, strikes them down. Now, I'm not telling you that's necessarily what's going to happen in your life. But you, you try to make some sort of theology where God doesn't care about your money or it's cool not to tithe. And at that very moment, you have stepped out of what means to be a biblical Christian. Period. There ain't no questions about it. There ain't no doubts. Tithing and giving is a part of what we do in loving God. And so look, rough times come in our life. Moments where we go, I don't know how I can do this. And in the New Testament, we're not stuck to this word tithe. This word tithe actually means 10%. Technically, in the New, New Testament, we're freed up to say all of it's his. And so I'm not telling you that if all of a sudden God has given you this revelation of money in your life, that you need to go sell all your goods and give it all away. I'm not not telling you that. That's between you and him. I am telling you, he, he calls you to be a good steward. And being a good steward is first and foremost recognizing and humbly submitting to him by saying, everything I have is yours. So I'm going to give for my first fruits here. And I'm going to believe that you're going to supply the rest. It's real easy to say. We should write a song about it, right? How many songs you got about tithing, right? Probably should have some. I mean, honestly, because that's the part that we don't want to give, give him. Oh, why do we talk about money so much? Because Jesus talks about it. Why does he talk about it so much? Because I don't want to give him my money, right? It's like Jerry Maguire. If y'all have seen that movie back from the like, late 90s, show me the money. Like, I don't want to give it to him because I feel like when I have money, I can take care of myself. I don't need him. Because I can rely on what that is rather than fully placing my hope and foundation on the thing that I can't see, but I firmly, fully believe in him. Tithing isn't just this thing that pastors get up and they try to beat you over the head with. It's a part of loving him. And it doesn't stop with tithing. You go through Exodus 20 and you see the Ten Commandments. He gives you this system to live your life. Deuteronomy 6 and you see the Shema. He talks about giving all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. That means you need to, you know, some people will say, oh man, I don't, I don't need to study the word that much. I don't need to ha be that intelligent in scriptures. Then how do you recognize, give him all of your mind? Right? Oh man, that's too deep for me. Maybe it is because you've never asked him to take you to the deep. I believe that God has made each and every one of us intelligent. He's made us with the ability to learn. Do you want to learn more about him? It's just the question. We no longer live underneath the laws of the Old Testament, but he has freed us to walk in the newness of him, and he's freed us to follow those laws, and when we fail, we still have grace. Those Ten Commandments were given to us to show us a way to live. 
Here's how you take care of your mother and your father. Here's how you take care of people. Here's how you love God. Here's how you love people. We talked about it. The first four are how we love him. The second six are how we love people. Oh, we're not, you know, stuck in the Old Testament system anymore. You're right. You're not stuck in it. You're freed to live and follow it with freedom. We've been set free. We don't work for salvation. We work from it. But I want to give you some practical examples of what it means to invest in his kingdom. So uh, let me get, hey, Stu, come help me out real quick. I know. I told him earlier he's coming. He's like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to listen to this sermon. I'm going to be nervous the whole time. Amy, help me out real quick. Uh, let's go. Kara, can you help me out real quick? Thank you. And, uh, you know, let's get a youngin. Come up here, Mr. You know, Mr. Trey. All right. So before y'all get all comfortable, there's a bunch of stuff over there, some flowers, tables, chairs. Y'all go grab them for me in the corner. Thank you. Appreciate that. So as they're doing that, I, I want to kind of talk to you about what it means practically to invest in his kingdom. Some tables, chairs, tablecloths, plates, all that. And as you're coming up, just if you would, just kind of set it up right here on the stage. So the key mechanism that God gives us to live out this idea of loving him is the church, all right? I know they're moving in, you know, you've got ADHD and you're looking over there, but try to, try to stay right here, okay? <laughs> the key mechanism that God gives us to live out this idea of loving him and loving others begins with the church. I can go through all the Old Testament scriptures and I can show to you how he gave very specific orders on how to build the, you know, the temple and how he put the priestly order together and all this, that, and the other. I can take you to the New Testament and show you how the apostles set it up. But what you need to do right now is just trust me. And if you don't believe me, go read all 66 books and you'll see it, right? He values a gathering place for his people. And this is how we then move out. That was a little shorter than I expected it to be. So what we do around here is we use language that kind of resembles and points back to Scripture. We talk about table fellowship. So a member at our church has what? A seat at the table. Because we believe that there is a table set up. And what we are to do as Christians is we are to go out into the world, invest in his kingdom by making his name known, by loving people, by prospering our city, and pointing them back to Jesus, ushering in them into this table. If y'all would just have a seat, if you would, thank you. Yeah, you're going to be up here for a while, uh, and you're going to get a bad view as well. So, <laughs> so here's what happens. We go out, we make his name known, and we usher people into the kingdom of God, and we say, hey, there's a seat at the table for you. What? Well, let's back up. How'd that table get there? They set it up, right? These four believers right here said, you know what? We're going to step out in faith and we're going to plant a church. Okay? Did this table come for free? Nope. Did that table set itself up? Nope. What about all this pretty ornate stuff? You know, man, look at that, right? Amazon, one ninety nine. Let's go. It didn't get there for free. It got there through finances. It got there through coordination and planning. Some of you, who grabbed a chair? Raise your hand. Okay, who grabbed the table? Boom. Who grabbed all the pretty stuff? Okay, Kara. She's. I was hoping Kara did something. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we got people like that seat at the table, right? We'll get there, but. Listen, there's a plan in place for a church. Now, what we want, here's what we want. We, we want our table to be really nice, and we want that seat to be there, but we don't really care if it's our seat. We don't, we don't care if our nameplate is proverbially etched on it, right? It'll be there when I get there. But what if it wasn't? Because if they didn't push back for a moment and prepare a table, would there be a table here? No. They didn't just show up by osmosis. People have to give. They have to serve. They have to invest in what God is doing in the local body of believers and saying, I believe in what is happening in this church. We don't talk about it a lot here, but membership matters. And membership at Piedmont is not just a little pretty thing. We probably call you down front and go, hey, look, they're pretty members. Here's their picture. They got three little cute kids. Isn't it wonderful? No. What I believe membership is, 
and will always be as long as I'm here is that you are invested into what God is doing at Piedmont Church. Some people go, uh, membership looks really complicated. How's that work? And, you know, there, there's a lot of practical ways that works. You fill out a piece of paper, and we interview you and make sure that you're actually a Christian. And I'm joking, but I'm also not joking, right? But, you know, another way we look at it is we go, all right, if we start seeing people coming, you look at our core values. If we see people present, if we see people starting to serve in the areas they can serve without being a member, meaning at the usher table and other places, because like, you can't serve at our next gen and our connection desk without being a member. But if you serve, if you come, if you serve, if you give, if you start connecting with us, being in an MCs, you know what we start saying? Whether these people said it or not, they're members. They got a seat at the table because they're investing here. Now, we want you to say that back to us, and here's why. Because I want to know who my sheep are. Biblically, what this means is I'm, I'm the elder, right? Lead pastor, shepherd, whatever you want to call it. And God has entrusted me to tend to the flock, to his flock, ultimately. But I'm here for just a moment. I need to know who my sheep are. So we've got people who have set up a table. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, if y'all want to, you know. You can, but anyway, Acts chapter 2, verse 40. I want to show you this picture a little deeply, a little deeper, I should say, and I want to challenge you to look at where God would call you to be the church. And if you are truly loving God, does your life resemble anything close to this? So Peter has just preached. The Holy Spirit has fallen on Jerusalem. Thousands of people have been saved. And now, here's what's happening. Verse 40. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. See what happens when the Holy Spirit moves? That, that, that doesn't just happen because somebody was a good communicator. That happens because God brought people from death to life. And it can happen today through the proclamation that you make. Not necessarily just me. You proclaim the word every time you go somewhere. You should be. Right? Like you, you could see people saved at Publix. Do you believe that it could happen? And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together. How many is that? It's about 3,000 souls that had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Notice it says those who were being saved. Mm. Let's look at what happens in this text really quickly. Number one, people were baptized. This is believer's baptism. So I don't know how you were raised, your historical and theological background. What we see time and time again from Scripture is that people gave their life to Jesus, and then they were baptized. Now, Jews came up through this system of kind of circumcision and, 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 and rituals and laws. And so what some denominational uh, leanings attach baptism to is something like that. Like if you baptize your child or you christen them or whatever, that is kind of like putting them into the family of God. You're welcome to believe that. That's not necessarily what we hold to here, but that is your, your decision. And it is a, you know, semi-biblical decision. That was rough. I shouldn't have said that. So we believe in believer's baptism. You see it ultimately time and time throughout Scripture. Number two, they devoted themselves to teaching. This is where the love God with all your mind comes, okay? So you have to devote yourself to the Word of God. You have to be in it. Oh, man, I, I, I love God. I love worship. Like, there's a lot of people out there that love this. Right now, right now our music is so good. We're at the like, all-time high of being able to manipulate our souls to, to sing something amazing. And if you don't think that's true, go find a musician, Hunter. I, I can get Hunter up on this stage right now, and I can sell you car insurance. And with him behind me, some of you will lean forward. I oh, mean, I need that car insurance, 
right? Because that little lick he's going to play, one, four, six, five, over and over again, is going to make you lean forward. It's going to make you go, ooh, give you little chills, right? We, I talk about it with pastors all the time. You put on the right Spotify playlist underneath the end of your sermon, and you can get 15 kids to get their life to Jesus. They're already Christians, but let's do it again. We have to value his word. We've got to sit underneath teaching. Number three, we see fellowship described as eating and praying together. It happens. They, they gather together. They pray for each other. They break bread. That didn't happen for free. That had a gathering place attached to it. That had somebody preparing a table and serving. That had somebody making food. There's all sorts of intricate parts that come into that, just that little bitty part. And then the fourth one, what do they do? They help those in need by raising money and giving things away. Go back over our core values. Be present, strive, give, connect, strive for excellence, and serve. This is what you see in the early church time and time again. And all five of those can be found in the foundation for building his church. As people come to the table we, in good faith, have to serve and give more so that there can be more seats at this table. If we don't, there will never be seats available. If we don't go above and beyond and try to grow this table, you know what's going to eventually happen? If we don't connect with each other, if we don't spur on each other, if we don't love each other, you know what's going to happen? Stu's going to leave. Amy's going to leave. Kara. Trey, they're going to leave. They need each other to pour into each other's lives. This is what it looks like to invest in his kingdom. It means people connecting with each other. It means people giving. It means people serving. And another thing that this, 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 this doesn't really paint perfectly, but in a real healthy church, here's what you start happening, is you start having little tables everywhere. Table and table and table and table. And notice there's no kitty tables. All those who are in Christ are the church now. They're not the church tomorrow. They're the church today. Why do you value the next gen? That's why. Because I'm not waiting for a 15-year-old to be 18 to go, man, now you can do something in the church. You're 15, let's go. I look at my 9-year-old son and say, bro, if you've committed your life to Christ, here's what's going to happen. When you get paid, you're going to tithe. You're going to give off of that. Why? Because daddy does. Because scripture tells you to. Let me show you. Let's, let's walk through this. We, stop, we have to bring our children up to know the Lord in the ways of how he would teach us. We also then have to prepare tables here and send other tables over here, like in Guatemala and in Scotland. Why? Well, because he tells us to make disciples. And to make disciples, what does he say? Teach them all that I have observed. And we've already learned today that one of the, the first and foremost principles that he's given us to disciple people and to make God known and to make them known to God, or God known to them, I should say, is he's given us the church. So that's why church planting matters. So when you give to us and then we give to Scotland and Guatemala, it's because we believe in the Great Commission. We believe that our money isn't just for us. Our money is to go out and to make an impact. Our service isn't just for us. We gather to scatter we will go and we will live as a family of servant missionaries. I preached for like 57 minutes. Y'all give, give it up for them. Thank you. The band can come up. No, you can leave it there. They'll sing around. It'll be all right. Here's the deal. If we're going to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We have to, have to, it's not optional, we have to invest in his kingdom. And the question I want to leave you with this morning is, are you doing that? Well, I, I don't give it all. Give a dollar. Start somewhere. Oh, I don't serve at all. Serve as an usher on a Sunday morning. Chris Bailey would love to have more ushers. It's a pretty easy job. I'm not trying to diminish it, but it's, it's where you greet people. You hold doors. You give them bulletins. And guess what? You don't miss any part of the service. Our next-gen, man, they got a hard job. 
Some of y'all got kids, y'all know, right? Because you look at my kids right now. They're missing the service too, week in and week out. There's a lot of other hard jobs. The band's up here preparing 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning, and many of them practicing during the week. They're giving hours, and that's just the in the walls service. There are a whole other multitude of ways to serve in and throughout the church. If you don't have community, find a missional community. Get plugged in so that you can have a little mini table in your life who's calling you to better things and to higher things. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you're going, okay, after all of this, I've, I've learned. Maybe I just I said a prayer, but I haven't really actually followed him. Well, you can do that today. You can do it right now. I don't even have to put, you know, pixie dust on you or anything, right? You just say, Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner and I believe in you and I want to follow you. That's it. That's all it is. And we can talk to you about baptism. We can talk to you about getting a seat at the table. We can talk about all sorts of things. But what I need you to leave with this morning is I need you to ask yourself this one question. If I say I love God, how am I investing in his kingdom? Let's pray.